Hey, how's it going? This is Joe Intel. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at the SVS 3000 micro subwoofer. So what is a micro subwoofer? So this is a sealed subwoofer that measures 10 inches cubed. Crazy. This has dual opposing eight inch drivers, claimed 800 watts RMS to 2500 watts peak. This has DSP with app control and they claim 23 Hertz plus or minus three DB, but they don't specify at what decibels. So real quick, SVS did send this out to me for review. So thank you to SVS. If you decide this is something you like, I'm gonna leave an affiliate link down below. So what the small sub is supposed to do is provide bass for music, movies. If you have a small to mid-sized room, maybe a bedroom, maybe a smaller living room, it's gonna be awesome if you're using it at a desk and you're just trying to use it maybe for studio monitoring, you want a sub, this might be a solution for that. And I would say if you're looking for a sub for home theater use or two channel use, this is something you might wanna take a look at. So who is this not for? It's not for if you have a dedicated home theater, a giant space, and you're looking for the craziest earth shattering base and you want it to just ruin stuff around your house and break lamps and vases, you know, stuff like that. This is probably not what you're looking for. So don't expect the sub to hit those ultra low subsonic frequencies at ridiculous SPLs. It just doesn't have enough output to pressurize larger rooms with super low bass. But having said that, this is still pretty awesome. Who is this for? I think it's actually a wider group of people than you might expect, and that's why I'm excited for this product. I think that they've really opened up the doors for people who may not want a big sub. They're gonna see some of the subs that are you know, huge, and they're like, no, 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 maybe this thing is not for me. But you know what? They might see this cute little sub and say, you know what, I can I can deal with that. Let me, let me try that in my two-channel system or for my home theater. And you know, it might open the doors and maybe they're gonna upgrade to larger subs in the future, but I think this is a good gateway to home theater and audio. So if you're someone or your significant other is someone who prefers to have looks over performance and price, because you will pay for having a smaller sub, but if that's a priority for you, you need a small sub, it won't fit, or you know, you just don't like the look of a bigger sub, well, this might be for you. Also, if you have limited space, so if you're using this, let's say in a bedroom, and you just simply don't have the room, then this sub might be for you. If you're planning on using it at a desk, I've actually used a normal size sub at a desk, and it really just kind of gets in the way. Your foot is always near the sub, it's gonna kick it. Whereas with something like this, you could really put it off to the side, it wouldn't be in the way. Perfect for if you want a subwoofer for desktop use, maybe even for studio monitoring because it's that good, that accurate. So it's good for you if you want quality base without having large cabinets, but also if you have realistic expectations for what this can and cannot do. Like I said, it can't produce ultra low subsonic frequencies at super high volumes, but in most cases, in my case especially, it's more than enough for my apartment here in the living room with just one, it's pretty good. I would prefer to have two or even three, but I think that with multiple subs, if you're willing to get a few of these for the price of you know what you'd spend on some larger subs or more expensive subs from other companies, you may find that you know a few of these and you're gonna be very, very satisfied. And the reason why it's a good idea to have two or more is although one can't produce ultra low frequencies at loud volumes, the moment you start adding more two or three or four, then you have some headroom and you can turn it up a little bit more. It just gives you the ability to have some, kind of the best of both worlds, right? Where you have small subs and you still have a good amount of output, but it requires you having multiple subs. So what does this do extremely well? First of all, it's really pushing the boundaries of Hoffman's Iron Law, which states that you can either have a small sub, a sub that can hit really low frequencies, or one that can get really loud. And so this has that balance where it's really small, 
The output is pretty impressive and it can hit pretty low. It's really pushing the limits there. And I think the way they're doing that is by throwing a lot of power at them and having the drivers that can actually handle that power. So speaking of Hoffman's Iron Law, I want to make my own Joe and Tell Law, maybe saying that, you know, the better the performance, but the smaller the sub, the more you're going to have to pay, something like that. One thing that was really, really impressive to me Something that was very weird, actually, was that the enclosure doesn't vibrate when it's playing crazy loud bass notes. And why is that? It's because both speakers are opposing. There's a sub, 8-inch sub on both sides, and they're both going opposite directions, which is balancing it out. If they're both going the same direction, I'm sure that thing might even walk off. And that was one of the issues with some of the older, smaller subs. I remember the Sunfire True Subwoofer. I remember people would say, like, this thing wants to walk off right it almost like it needs some weight to make sure that it doesn't move and this is crazy because at a certain point i was seriously not sure if it was on because i touched the enclosure it wasn't vibrating and it was just kind of amazing i had to actually put my ear to the sub not because it wasn't loud but because with good bass frequencies if the subwoofer is not making any noises if the motor structure is not making any noises unwanted noises you really can't tell where the bass is coming from you just hear bass and so what i had to do is i had to unplug from the back and all the bass just went away i'm like oh man it was on that's crazy what else is it good at it's good at impressing you and my wife was impressed she was like wow this thing is pretty awesome like her impression was like why would somebody buy a bigger sub if you could just get one of these and of course i had to explain if you want crazy loud volumes if you had a huge living room then you're gonna want a bigger sub but in our situation, like I'm saying, she's like, I don't see why we need those other subs. Pretty amazing. And it's also very good at making you smile. You can see right here, I'm very happy. I'm very excited for this product because I think it's awesome. I'm excited for people who are just getting into this or maybe couldn't afford the space to get new subs. This is very interesting, a different product segment that I'm very excited about. It's also very good at utilizing DSP to give it a flat response and also to extend the bass response because this is almost impossible to do without DSP to be able to hit this low. I mean, it's amazing. And so I think SVS does a great job tuning their subs as well. And so this, of course, it has very good performance if you measure it, but also in the room when you put it near a wall, of course, you're gonna get that boundary gain. You're gonna get an enhancement in the bass and they've tuned it for the enhancement that you would kind of expect in most rooms. Very smart. Another thing it does extremely well is it looks cute in the manliest way possible. It looks awesome. I mean, if you look at the amp, it extends down to the bottom. That's pretty dope. And also the subs on the side, the grills to protect them has a different look and it has this kind of curved look. I'm not sure if I love that. It kind of looks cool with them off. You're not supposed to take them off, but I did it for the video. Sorry, SVS. So what does it do okay? For me, I think it did a okay job of providing enough bass for most movies, especially with room gain. I didn't find that I needed more, right? It's not like, man, I'm missing something. Nothing like that. So like I said earlier, if I had two or more of these, I think I would be satisfied with a bass in this room. I wouldn't prefer any more actually. So the DSP app is pretty cool on this. It allows you to use parametric EQ in case you're using, let's say a two channel system that doesn't have the ability to add delay or gain or parametric EQ for the subwoofers. This will allow you to do it on the subwoofer itself. So that's pretty handy. In my case, my AVR does all that. So I didn't really have to use it but it's there if you need it. Also on the back, it does have RCAs and LFE input. It also has an output and a trigger in case you want your preamplifier to turn this on automatically. The only thing I wish it had, just in case, is a high level input. Some people like to do that and it's nice to have that option. It's not on this one. The other way that it uses DSP on this is it limits the distortion. So I've tried to turn it up and try to get it to distort. And once it starts reaching that level, it starts to just not allow it. Basically, you can't turn it up anymore. And so you won't hear any nasty noises. It just kind of tames it down, says, you know, this is the limit. So what are some of the downsides? Downsides, 
is it's not going to scare you it's not overkill basically right like some of these other systems that i see and that's okay if you want overkill if that's what you want then that's cool it's just not gonna get it from two eight inch dual opposing drivers in the small 10 inch enclosure so to me how it's pushing the limits of hoffman's iron law i think this is the limit of good enough right so other subs may go way beyond that but to me this is just at that point where this is this is good so i can see how having two or more of these is just that's it's almost like more than enough once you start stacking multiple together with a single one it's just right there at just enough just right so the last thing is the price once again i'm going to leave an affiliate link in the description if you want to check out the current pricing but as of right now it's i think around seven eight hundred bucks and for that price you can get a sub from svs that will outperform this right so i'm currently reviewing the pb 1000 pro which comes in at about 200 dollars less and so that will outperform the sub but it's also significantly bigger and i think that's one thing people don't understand is going let's say from a 10 inch cube like this um 3000 micro to let's say a 13 inch cube in the sb 2000 that's not a small difference right it sounds like oh just two inches here no i mean two inches each direction so volume wise it's a significant difference you can see it here next to the sb 3000 that i have and you can see it next to the pb 1000 pro it is significantly smaller here next to a bookshelf speaker you can see that it's very similar in size and in dimension so what are some alternatives of course you can't ignore the kef kc62 which is dual six and a half inch drivers smaller enclosure and i mean that's kind of nuts right six and a half subs anyway i think that those guys are really pushing the limits the boundaries of making a smaller sub now i haven't heard of myself but i have seen some of the specs that they throw out there they say 11 hertz and max of 105 decibels the problem is it's not 11 hertz at 105 decibels because that is just it, it kind of leads you to assume that and of course that's not the case they have a graph here that shows what the performance of the kc62 is and i'm not downplaying what that's doing because i think it's actually really awesome and what it's doing is it adjusts dynamically meaning let's say if you have it at low volume it keeps it really flat and it extends it out really far so you are getting you know even down to that 20 hertz range at low volumes right the moment you start to turn it up instead of extending out far it starts to just kind of turn up the frequencies it can produce and it starts not being able to produce some of those lower frequencies so basically it can't produce 20 hertz at really loud volumes it's just physically impossible and so that's kind of trickery in in my opinion in the way they marketed that what i do like about this 3000 micro is in my testing it doesn't have that dynamic adjustment basically it's flat down in my room i saw it hit 22 hertz at minus three decibels and this is not in the corner this is like in the center of the room so i was trying to not get room gain and so 22 hertz but also as i turned it up it stayed consistent you can see here it's not adjusting and the the frequency response isn't changing as i turn it up it's just rising up in volume so to me that was very impressive that it's able to hit 22 hertz of course when i throw it in the corner i can get 20 hertz because you're getting boundary gain right you're getting an enhancement in the lower frequencies and so that's pretty impressive another alternative as i said earlier is some other products from svs like their sb 1000 pro or sb 2000 pro or uh, the ported versions if you don't mind larger enclosures so that's the thing if you don't have to have the smallest possible sub you may want to take a look at some of those other options All right, so this is a test of the SVS 3000 micro from three feet away. I'm gonna do a sweep from 10 hertz to 500 hertz.
so that's pretty much it for all the folks who want to get into the technical stuff i have some graphs to take a look at and these are the measurements that i took in room and i'm going to compare them quickly to the kc62 all right so here we are looking at the svs 3000 micro and we're in rew this is an in-room measurement meaning that it's not an outdoor ground plane so this is not a spec that you can trust 100 percent if you want something like that check out my buddy aaron from aaron's audio corner he does some CEA or so now CTA 2010 A and B testing. So if you're into that, there's some of that on his website. So check this out. Basically, we're looking at the frequency response. We're seeing peaks around 100, 103, and you can see it's relatively flat above 30 hertz, right? So that's DSP kicking in. And so even here, let's say 33 hertz, we're still at... 100 decibels and this was taken three feet away so let's see here at higher let's say 120 uh, you know maxing out around 100 304 decibels from three feet uh three feet away so not super loud but you know what can you expect for something this size here's what you want to also take a look at is we're taking a look at the minus three db point the average on here is 96 decibels. I know it doesn't look like it, but if you were to take the average, it would be right here. This is the reference point that I used, um, the volume that I used when taking this me measurement. So around here, 3 dB down from here would be 93 decibels. So at 93 decibels, we're at 23 hertz. That is pretty awesome. And if you wanted to go down a little bit more, you can see around here, it's at 88 decibels at 20 hertz, not bad. So quickly, I wanna compare this with a KEF KC62. And this graph in the background is taken from KEF's white paper. And so you see here with the big numbers, this is their graph. And theirs are the ones with the green, the yellow, and the red, and also the dashed lines, All right? So this showing what happens with the KEF at lower volumes. It's pretty flat and they claim that 11 hertz over here. All right, and then the dash line is in room with room gain. So I'm assuming that's kind of in a corner or something like that based on what this is showing me. But you can see here as, as the volume goes up, the curve is no longer flat, right? So you can see their curve gets a little bit rounder with the red one. And um, this is not something that I noticed on this SVS. So this blue line, this darker blue line is my measurement. This lighter blue line is actually the measurement from SVS. So you can see that they're pretty aligned, right? You can see that they track each other pretty well. One thing to notice about the SVS compared to the KEF, in red is the KEF at its loudest volume. You can see around here, around 100 hertz, they both hit about the same SPL. But after 70 hertz, you can see that the KEF starts to drop off, which you'd expect because they're dual six and a half versus this one, which is dual eight inch drivers. But this one, the SVS just continues to extend out even at this particular SPL, which is what you want. So here we're saying, let's say around 30 Hertz, we're still at around 100 dB with the SVS, whereas with the KEF, according to their specs, is already down to about 90 decibels. So that's half the volume, half the perceived volume. Now 20 Hertz, you can also see that there's a difference here, the SVS around 90-ish decibels, whereas the KEF would be down another five decibels from there. So make sure to check out the subwoofer leaderboard. I'll leave a link in the description because as of making this video, SVS has still actually not announced this. And so I'm not allowed to show it publicly and this is public. So make sure to check the link and you'll see where this subwoofer places. All right, so there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you found it useful. If you did, make sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell to be notified when I upload new videos. Anyway, that's it. Take care. Bye-bye.